jurisdiction and red tape and bureaucracy. And uh, some might argue it's, it's, it's just way too much, but certainly very, very free in the United States. And uh, I, I like the, the fact that you have got real freedoms here, but the people of the United States need to understand that there are people that want to take away that. I like the, the fact that you have got real freedoms here, but the people of the United States need to understand that there are people that want to take away that. They want to take away the Second Amendment. They want to do away with the Constitution, the Bill of Rights. Uh, and these are democratic principles that enshrined in law, and you must fight for them. Absolutely vital that you do. But yeah, the, the American people, I don't think, I, wouldn't, I would never insult the American people by calling them naive, Larry. I, I wouldn't do that. It's just that you may not have seen the evidence of what's happening in Europe, what's happening in the UK just yet. But you've got to understand that it is likely to be coming here. And you must fight because you've got every reason to fight. You've, you, know, you can see what's happening. My biggest concern for you guys is the American southern border. It's wide open. For whatever reason, Biden and the globalist agenda, it's not happening by accident. People are flooding into the United States at the southern border, unchecked. They have no idea about their backgrounds. They don't know whether they are... And don't care. And they, well, they seem... And don't care. care. They don't care. And the same thing is happening across the English Channel. We are having boatloads of people coming in. And Richie Sunak wrings his hands and says, well, we're still connected to the EU, so the ECHR, the European uh, Council for Human Rights legislation, still applies. But if he was really serious about it, he would say to the EU, we're not having that, and stop them at the source. But what's happening there is the French Navy are taking them halfway across, the British Navy are meeting them halfway, and taking them in. You couldn't make it up. So there is a globalist agenda, and I believe that mass illegal migration is being used, quite deliberately, to destabilize independent sovereign countries like the United States, like the United Kingdom. It's happened in France. It's happened in other European countries. It's happening in Australia. It's happening in New Zealand. And it's happening in Canada. Generally speaking, I think that our... I've written extensively on what, what was titled when I wrote for the American Spectator and others, a series called um, The Border Crisis from the Other Side of the Border. So uh, it occurred to me that you had people like Laura Logan, for instance, who are writing about the border crisis, going down, Sarah Carter, you know, going down and looking at what was happening on the border from the American side, on the Texas side. But I thought, let's let's go across the Rio Grande. I swam the Rio Grande um, once. I swam to Mexico and back. Why not, why not go to the other side? And um, I, so I went throughout South America interviewing refugees who are trying to make their way to the United States. And I have maintained that our refugees are superior to your refugees to this extent. Uh, it's not to say that we don't get a lot of bad apples or that there aren't any Muslims crossing our border, because certainly there are. But generally speaking, these are people who are fleeing, yes. say, Venezuelan oh, yeah. socialism. Um, they're, they're trying to get out of countries that have been wrecked by socialism. They're coming out of Catholic backgrounds. They're typically hardworking, family-oriented people. And they're the kind of people who are entering into, let's say, the Darien Gap, which is 60 kilometers of the most dangerous jungle in the world. If you're not familiar with Darien or the Darien Gap, it sits like a cork on top of South America. It's the it's the border wall, the, the, the natural border wall that exists between Panama and Colombia. And um, there are no roads through it. So whenever you see um, you know, a, a, a movie or a TV show that shows somebody who's supposedly driving you know, from, from California, say, all the way to the tip of South America, well, you can't drive through there. There are no roads. So you have to take a ferry around it. And these people are entering in 
in flip flops and a yeah. bottle of water and carrying a baby, and not always, but often a ma managing to uh, come out on the other side. And you're going, no border wall is going to stop these people. They're they're that determined. And when you bring up the word socialism to them, uh, they they understand the you know the the Spanish version socialismo is very you know they they know the word in English, yeah. Yeah. and they roll their eyes and they they kind of gasp at no this is this is wrecked. Yep. You know, our country. So when I'm talking to those people, I'm thinking, I would swap any number of Democrats for one of these people <laughs> because they're often very hardworking, right. family-oriented, oriented, and they believe in the American dream. They they want to be a part of that. But that's those aren't the immigrants so much that you're getting in Britain. You're getting them coming out of Muslim context. They're not assimilating. Uh, you have the call to prayer going out uh, throughout Britain now, and they pollute a culture. And I... I, I want to be very clear when I say this. Some people will be angry to hear me say that uh, because you've bought into the globalist, multiculturalist bullshit, which just simply isn't true that all cultures are equal. All cultures are not equal. Some cultures bring human degradation. And those Muslims, and there are the fuzzy westernized Muslims who are Muslim in name only, but they're... They, they, they do assimilate. But those Muslims who model their lives after Muhammad, as they're commanded to do, who take the Hadith and the Quran seriously, those aren't people who assimilate. And those are people who, according to a BBC poll, 27% of British Muslims were sympathetic with the Charlie Hebdo yeah. terrorist attacks, which occurred in Paris in 20. 15, a slaughter. Imagine 27% yeah. of evangelical Christians who were sympathetic with, say, abortion clinic bombings. I dare say that there would be alarm yeah. over this. So these are the kinds of um, immigrants that you're getting. And this has led to, to horrors like the Rotherham scandal, where, yeah. where to quote the Times of London, British white girls, and I, I stress British white girls because they specifically were targeted by Muslim men, mostly Pakistani Muslim men, some Afghans, and they were, to quote the Times of London, raped on an industrial yeah. scale. At last count, um, over 19,000 British girls trafficked and raped, and almost no one has been punished for this. I mean, would you agree with me that these kind of immigrants... This, this kind of open channel, we, yeah. we'll say open channel policy that you've yeah. had in Britain is leading to the absolute annihilation of British culture. Oh, I don't think that's a, a, a too, too strong a way to put it at all. And you're absolutely right uh, about some of the, the migrants that are coming in. And the other thing it's always important to point out, no one that's decent uh, or fair-minded would in any way uh, turn uh, a true asylum seeker away. If they're fleeing a, a, a war zone, they have men, women, or children in particular, women and children, nobody's going to want to turn anybody like that away. Humanity is humanity, and we're all human beings at the end of the day. We want to reach out to those people and give them safe passage and safe safe harbor. But that's not what we're witnessing. I, I, um, I will, I will oh, pardon me, I would add this caveat. I would turn them away if they cannot respect and assimilate the culture that is our culture. It doesn't mean, people seem to take this to mean, I mean, for instance, you're, you're a Scot. You're a, yeah. you're a proud Scottish Highlander, which, by the way, that needs to be the name of your show, The Highlander. <laughs> I'm just going to say that would be a brilliant name. This this is a separate conversation over cigars and Cabernet <laughs> on, on my porch, but that needs to be the name of your show. You heard it here first, ladies and gentlemen, the Highlander. But, um, you know, we, we say in our Declaration of Independence, we hold these truths to be self-evident that yeah. all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. And among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. If you are becoming an American citizen, traditionally speaking, you had to be able to say, we hold these truths to be self-evidential. If you, you can't be a member of our club if you can't Correct. agree to the mission statement, because this is who we are. Yeah. And if you're bringing in a philosophy that is anti-Western, anti-democratic, 
um, pro-terrorist. Yeah. No, you can't join our, and, and I don't care what you're fleeing. We're not bringing you in here if you can't agree to that. And that's what I think is the problem is that multiculturalism, uh, it's a lie. And it it is it is absolutely destroying the fabric of Western civilization because it can no longer be said, we hold these truths to be self-evidential. And although that's not a part of your own you know, constitutional um, uh, traditions, that sentiment was born out of those traditions. I mean, our Declaration of Independence was born out of a tradition of English common law, English jurisprudence, English history. Margaret Thatcher very accurately said, as did the Queen of England, your history is our history. Right. So, uh, and that's, that's very, very true. So I'm not interested in taking any immigrants who can't agree to those simple terms, but continue. Yeah, I mean, I, there's an old saying, Larry, that says, uh, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. <laughs> and, and I think those of us uh, that go and travel to other countries, we abide by those rules, we abide by those laws, we respect the religion or the culture that we are experiencing. Of the host country. Of the host country. And that's not what's happening with a lot of these migrants that are coming in through the channel, because they are coming from a particular uh, mindset. Well, you were just telling me um, over coffee, uh, pre-show, you were telling me about a um, British politician who would not say Merry Christmas. Well, that was the British Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak. Yes. And, and as the head of the country, as, as the Prime Minister, he should be uh, reflecting his, his, his position to all the people of Great Britain. And, and, and explain to us why he said he wouldn't do that. Uh, well, he, he, he's, a, he's of the Hindu faith, and he, so he celebrates Diwali, and he was happy to, to, to light candles on the, on the doorstep of number 10, which I don't have an issue with, except that he should also reach out to the Christians, who are the largest uh, group within the United Kingdom. For and, now. Uh, for, for now, and, you know, pay, pay his respects because a lot of us, well, I didn't, but a lot of others... What a slap in the face. It's a bit insulting, isn't it? So I think that respect, we, we, we you know, have gone out of our way as British people and as American people to respect other nations, other cultures, other faiths. But it's not reciprocal, Larry, and it, it, it's, seen, it's been seen on the streets of London. I mean, my old boss, Nigel Farage, of the Brexit Party, has been astonished at the anti-Israeli sentiment. There are people out there waving Palestinian flags celebrating what happened to the, the civilians and the children of Israel being massacred by Hamas. And they're waving these flags. They're chanting death to the Jews, gas the Jews, on the streets of our capital city. Why? Because they've come in in such numbers. But we've got to understand that there is a reason behind this. And it's a globalist reason. And I don't have any doubt about it. Larry, that these people are being allowed to come in in sufficient numbers to deliberately destabilize and weaken the host countries. And uh, to destroy the culture, yes. uh, of, without a doubt. Um, I, I quoted 27%, uh, quoting the BBC, 27% of British Muslims were sympathetic with the Charlie Hebdo attacks. I haven't seen a poll as it relates to um, Hamas and um, what's going on there, but 27% translates... In 2015, when Charlie Hebdo occurred to 700,000 yep. British Muslims that that are potential terrorists, and you talking about you know um, these protests, which if you watch, if you look at when he says his channel, you're talking about Twitter, you're talking about X. Yeah, yeah tell people where they can find you. Sure, sure. You, you can follow me on Jim. Uh, so it's at Jim Ferguson, capital UK, and the J is a capital J, and the F is a capital F. And the reason that I am primarily on Twitter is because, thanks to Elon Musk, and I know that, that some people are, you know, down on Elon, but, but I, if it wasn't for Elon Musk, I wouldn't be sitting here today with you. Um, because he's given that, that platform. He truly does believe in free speech, and I know it's not perfect, and some people have still had difficulties with it, whether it's being shadow banned or whether they're being blocked. I, I, I don't know. The previous regime... Was, was much worse. I think that what we're seeing with Musk, and I've talked about it on this show, is that Musk is certainly 
aware of what's happening with the Tucker Carlson's, oh, yeah. for instance, or a, a James Woods. He's yeah. he's he's very aware of that. But his hiring of Linda Yaccarino in May of this year, I think, is a disaster. And uh, and I do because I think that she is hiring more of um, the the previous regimes, liberal geeks, um, yeah. who are suppressing accounts, mine um, among them. I mean, I gained almost 100,000 follow, 100, followers when Musk um, took over. And then since he's hired her, you know, yeah. um, that has changed for me. But right now you're still flying under the radar. <laughs> so you're, uh, you're ascending and that's great because your voice, your voice that needs, that needs to be heard, but continue. So, I mean, we, we see, we, we, you talked about Lara Logan earlier on. I mean, I, I've a huge respect for her. Uh, she has followed me on the channel. In fact, some, there, there are some big names that are following me on the channel, you know. Um, and, and I think perhaps that's probably helped to drive the interest. I've covered some things from the French riots to what happened with Hamas and the massacre of the Israelis and lots of other things uh, in detail. And, and so that there's a lot of followers coming onto the channel and that, that seems to be gathering pace. There is steady growth, but... When I go into really heavily report on things as it's happening, breaking news style, that's when we get significant growth. And it was only a matter of a few weeks ago that we turned over 100,000 uh, followers on Twitter. And, and they're great people. You know, one of the things, Larry, that, that I sometimes do is I reach out to them and say, look, uh, can you help me to find out about this or, or, or what's your opinion on that? And I'll spend an entire afternoon or an entire Sunday uh, afternoon just talking to them and they know that I'm there because I'm answering their questions, I'm interacting with them. So it's become a bit of an online family with me. But X primarily, at, certainly at the moment, is sort of the, the only real platform that I'm speaking on and you can find me there. But, um, you know, going back to Lara, she, she's uh, an, an incredible reporter and there are, there are other great people. That are She'll following. be joining the show here soon. So you, but you, You'll have a great interview, I'm sure, with, with her. She's very, very knowledgeable and she's not frightened to speak her mind either. That's one of the things I really respect about a her. A very she, courageous. Courageous lady, yeah, absolutely. We need courage. We need people like that. Well, that that's a discussion right there. But I want to go back to something that you you said very casually that I really want to underscore because it's a profound remark. It's profoundly true. That is, in talking about multiculturalism, you said it's not being reciprocated. That's right. And let's let's really drive that home for our listeners, for our viewers. The cultural engineers, they're telling us, hey, you know, Westerners are arrogant, they're racist, they're all these terrible things, xenophobic, they need to show appreciation for other cultures. So we um, are all supposed to open our borders, to open our doors, to let other people in um, to the countries that our forefathers have built and bequeathed to us. Um, that were safe places for human beings to flourish. And that came at the cost of blood. I mean, the currency of freedom is blood. Is. That has been the currency of freedom. But that's what we've all been told. And the, by and large, those who are coming into our country, uh, countries rather, um, since we're, we're not citizens of the same country, they're not reciprocating that. Those Muslims that I was referring to before coming into Britain, coming into the United States, I mean, they're creating, they're cre recreating their own cultures in enclaves, of what have become no-go zones in Britain, um, in Germany, in France, uh, in Spain. Um, we're seeing it in places like Dearborn, Michigan. Yep. Uh, our Muslim population is much smaller than, than your Muslim um, population, but they're not assimilating. And not only do they not appreciate the culture they want to destroy the culture so it's not simply that they're that they um they aren't reciprocating they hate the host country well and the, 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 there is i mean sweden is a very good example of this as well because they were very welcoming very multicultural in their approach welcomed these people and now they're saying to come in and i kid you not now they've had to deploy the military in Sweden mm -hmm. to take control of it because the violence is off the charts. Oh, the, they've let the orcs the rape, into the Shire. That's, the, that's what has happened. The, the rapes are, 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 are off of, the of charts. Swedish women are, are off the charts. And uh, we, we call it sort of uh, integration. I mean, assimilation, integration, it's the same type of thing. But they are predatory in their approach. They believe that their particular worldview is superior 
to the host nation. Oh, it's so, Islamophobic. Excuse me. It is not Islamophobic. Excuse me. It is misogynistic. Yeah. It is anti-democratic. It is anti-Western. It is anti-Christian. Um, it is hateful in every meaningful way. And when we were talking about, you mentioned the rape of um, Swedish women, but it's throughout Western Europe, these sex gangs exist, and it's because it is part of the religion. It's not... It's not incidental that no. these were Muslim men. No. In fact, the Times of London, when they first broke the, the Rotherham scandal, and they didn't know at the time that Rotherham was, wasn't an anomaly, that yeah. these sex gangs were all over Britain and they're all over Europe, so that they wouldn't appear to be Islamophobic, they said that it was Asians. I don't know if you recall this, I but do. they said it was yes. Asians. And then you had Asians like Sikhs and Chinese who and Koreans not, not who said, no, no, no. Yeah. These are not Asians who are doing yeah. this. Th these you need to be specific. These are these are Muslim yeah. men who are doing this, and mostly Pakistani and some Afghan men who are doing this, and uh, and they're doing it all over Europe. And that is because, according to Islam, you can rape yeah. um, infidels. You can rape non-Muslim women. You can do this. They are they are plunder. And a lot of these British girls, when they were interviewed about this, they said that their rapists were quoting the Quran as they were raping them. I mean, you, this you, is this what this religion is. The, the Chinese. I mean, I I've had a lot of interaction with the the Chinese community, and uh, served on different committees with Chinese representation. Uh, and great, great people, uh, been to, to many Chinese dinners, as I was telling you last night about the multiple courses and, and, and how it works, you know. Uh, great people, industrious people, very clever people. Likewise, I've been to Indian Association dinners, celebrating their Diwali. I'm a Christian, but I will pay my respects if I go along to something like that. And when I was very politically active, I was often invited to these types of things. Um, the, and the Sikh community, the Sikh community, a very proud community. You know, the, a lot of people don't understand, and they mistakenly think that somebody, that, wears, Muslims, yeah. that somebody that wears the turban is a Muslim. They are not. Uh, and, and, and it's very important that, that, that people understand that. They are very peaceful people, very fierce, very proud warrior race of people. The Sikhs are, are, are a war, warrior uh, type uh, um, group, uh, and I have a lot of respect for them. They are not the ones who are causing those issues. In fact, they are as just as alarmed as other uh, nationalities within Britain about what's actually happening. So you, you're correct uh, to, to highlight that. But I think even if it wasn't a, a religious issue, the very fact, if we go just, just take it a step back for a second, regardless of what faith it might be, regardless of what culture it might be, if you put enough people into a small community, you're going to destabilize it anyway because there's not enough housing, there's not enough health care, there's not enough educational slots. And even if, all, even if you took 2 million Brits and decided to send them here to Alabama, you would have a major problem, not because we were necessarily bad people or doing anything, but your, your, your health care system wouldn't cope with that kind of an influx. Your education system would be in meltdown. Um, your housing wouldn't be able to cope with it. I mean, Alabama's a great big place, but you wouldn't have the, the housing to, to, to adequately provide. The job situation would, wouldn't be able to cope with it. So it's not all about just that. It's just about sheer volume of numbers. And the globalists know this, Larry. And once again, what they're looking to do is to cause division. They want there to be division because as we fight amongst ourselves, they move unseen to their next agenda. And their agenda is a new world order that they control. Sovereign governments will cease to be. They will control it. In fact, I put out a post about uh, six, seven weeks ago where Klaus Schwab was actually talking about the fact that we, we don't really need elections, do we? Because we are already predictive. We, he's talked about predictive, uh, predictive um, uh, sort of forward thinking. And he said, we could probably tell the way people are going to vote. Therefore, why have the elections? And he was being serious. This is why yeah. people in America need to understand when people like that say these things in those kind of positions of power, you better take note because he's serious about it. And the, the, you might think, well, we've got the Congress and we've got the Senate. Yeah, you do. But how many of these Congress 
men and women and how many senators are actually signed up to the World Economic Forum, you'd, you'd be surprised how many actually are. So their loyalty is to the globalist new world, world order, not to the people who've elected them into those positions of Congress or Senate. And there are good senators and there are good Congress people in the United States. We have got one or two, and I do say one or two or maybe three, decent members of parliament, like Andrew Bridgen, for example, uh, who was a conservative, who was kind of ostracized and, and thrown out because of his views on asking for accountability in terms of the, the vaccines. And the party turned on him because they didn't want uh, those kind of questions to be asked, things like excess deaths, vaccine injuries. And of course, Richie Sunak, we must always remember, who stood up in the British Parliament stating that the vaccines were safe and effective. What nobody realised at that point was that he had invested $500 million into Moderna, which is one of the main vaccine producers, and um, stands to make billions in profit. Oh, but, but Jim, I mean, surely that was just coincidental. <laughs> no, no, Larry, it wasn't. Um, yeah. You know, we've seen this with our own politicians, you know, individuals uh, like uh, Nancy Pelosi, mm -hmm. uh, for instance, who has benefited uh, massively, Mitch McConnell, who uh, has benefited um, uh, massively, Liz Cheney, you know, people who are entering into Congress, you know, say worth, you know, half a million dollars when they enter and then leaving office with um, tens of millions oh, yeah. of of dollars in net worth and you think wow you know how did that happen on a government salary yeah, exactly. i guess i guess they just got lucky in vegas or won a lottery yeah this level of corruption we're seeing in our country and you're certainly seeing it in your own as well immigration is a massive issue and uh it's what we're seeing in the western world and i'm reminded of you know i speak as a historian when i say this the greeks really began doing this and conquering a territory in order to maintain a certain level of instability so that uh, those conquered territories couldn't organize themselves against them. They would, they would move populations from one country, uh, one region into another, knowing that it would destabilize it and there would be um, friction between those um, demographics. And so long as they were fighting with each other, they, they couldn't, couldn't fight them. And this is also what the Romans did. The Romans did something very similar to that and is now what we are seeing um, that the globalists are doing. And America, most of all, has to be taken down. And that is because America has remained um, the, the linchpin of freedom. And if, Amer if the American uh, a ship is swamped, you can bet that that many smaller boats yep. um, will be swamped as well. Jim, as we uh, as we conclude this particular episode of Ideas Have Consequences, what would be you know given what you've seen in Britain, what you've seen in Europe uh, that the globalists are doing, what would be your advice to those people who are listening to us? I would say uh, be aware, be aware of what's going on. Don't think that you're immune here in the United States, and unfortunately, you're not. You may not see that yet in the areas that you're in, but it is coming. Uh, don't panic, don't live in fear, but take positive steps, engage with your community, get to know who, who everybody is, and those that share your values and your beliefs uh, stand with each other, because there is great good in this world. We, we need to get organized, and we need to push back against globalists and those that seek to destroy our freedom. Uh, I love America, and I love the American people. Jim, it's been great to have you on the show. Thanks My for, pleasure. Thanks for being here. Thanks a lot.